Good morning. How's everybody this morning? It is so good to see you. We're going to start in just a minute. We're going to sing a couple of songs uh, that have King in the title. Okay? We're going to sing a song called Only King Forever and the hymn Lead On, O King Eternal. When I was doing some research on that second one, uh, I was thinking it was kind of along that onward Christian soldiers banner of the cross kind of marching along uh, to war kind of song. And that's the way it looks. But as it turns out, the guy that wrote it was graduating from seminary. And this song is all about what happens after you get ready to do something, when you go on and do it, uh, lead on, O King Eternal, the day of March has come. Hence, maybe they graduated in March. I don't know. Henceforth, in fields of conquest, thy tents shall be our home. You think it's like a, a battle camp, but it's not. The tents talking about the places that, that folks are going to be going on mission fields and things. Through days of preparation, thy grace has made us strong. That was pretty easy. And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. The second verse keeps on talking about um, not, not loud, clashing, roll of stirring drums, deeds of love and mercy. That's where people hear about uh, God in heaven. The third verse keeps on talking about that. It's going to be a good time. I want you to look at the words and listen to them as you sing them this morning as we exalt the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Would you stand with us, please? Let's begin our time of worship together. That doesn't necessarily sound like a king song. of love. They're not going to hear it on the 6 o'clock news. 
They're not going to hear it from the White House. They're not going to hear it from a sports arena somewhere. They're not going to hear it from the Academy Awards or the Tony Awards. They're not going to hear it on Broadway. They're not going to hear it in the business world. They're going to have to hear it from us. But you know what? It's not they have to hear it from us. It's they get to hear it from us. So let's sing, We Lift Our Banner High. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. that I told you about this next song, okay? Lead on, O King Eternal. And talk about the preparation that we've made and how we can move on from there and do what God has trained us to do. Whether we're, we're from seminary or whether we're from our town, God has something for us to do. Henceforth in fields of conquest, thy tent shall be our home. Through days of preparation, thy grace has made us strong. And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. Fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, or roar of stirring drums, with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly King. As we continue worship and as we pray, we're going to uh, resume our study in the book of Acts. And so if you're watching by television or social media this morning, uh, go ahead, uh, fbctifton.org slash notes. You can pick up our notes. I've had some folks ask when are we going to get back to that. And so we'll be concluding the study of the book of Acts in, in the coming weeks. As we worship today, there's much just to turn over to God and, and quit carrying that baggage, that load alone. He says, my, my yoke is easy, burden is light, so turn it over to me and let Jesus carry it today. Bow with me. 
Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. And not only did he die for us, but he was raised again. And, and when he rose and ascended to heaven, you sent your Holy Spirit to be with us, to bring the comfort and strength we need to live in this difficult time. There's so much going on around us, Lord, with this, this pandemic, with uh, the, the transition of, of leadership in our nation, with a world at odds within itself. We thank you that we have a king eternal that we can follow. And when we see his face, gladness will erupt in our hearts. And we can find in you that foundation that is sure and steady. When everything else around us seems to be in shambles, we lean into you. Be with us in worship, Lord. Teach us through the Apostle Paul the lessons that he learned and help us to emulate that pattern in our lives today. Father, we look to you, we love you, we thank you for loving us. Let our worship be genuine today. In your name we pray, amen. We are so glad to see each one of you here this morning worshiping with us and uh, delighted that you've come. Also, we're extremely glad those that are worshiping with us through television or, or through the web and, and just glad that you're a part today of whether it's virtually or in person, just worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ. What an exciting privilege we have and just so grateful uh, to be a part of this team and to be a part of this fellowship that we call First Baptist. If you're worshiping with us today and you're, you're our guest, we invite you to uh, be a part of an age-old custom that we've done here. You have to reach out your hand, and there's a little card in the back of these pews, and you grab one of those cards, and if you'll just uh, share with us the information you're comfortable with, uh, that'll uh, uh, give us the opportunity to minister to you in the future. Also, we have a small gift that we uh, send in correspondence to those who, who share with us about themselves. You can do that on the, on the Internet as well. You can go to fbctifton.org and uh, slash connect. And you can fill out that Connect card there. And again, we'd have the privilege of, of connecting with you. We know member, many of our, our members right now are, are worshiping with us virtually or over TV. And so we expect also that many of our guests are doing the same. But we're just glad that you're here. And we're excited about what the Lord is going to say to our hearts as we worship him today. Barry? Stand it. Let's sing some more. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, oh, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth. we believe we got to show people we believe it. how do we do that by letting people know that it's a new horizon our eyes are set on him let's sing it together it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to 
because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. Sing that again. It's a new horizon set, and I'm set on you. Cause you meet me here today with mercies that I knew. Oh yeah, my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that I knew all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay pray. Father, we don't know or understand completely what you're doing in and around us in these days, but we admit to you how weak we are, and we trust that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Sometimes, Lord, we have to get on our knees to look up, and we're on our knees now. We are we are broken people. This pandemic has taken a toll not only in our world, but and not only in our nation, but right here in our own community. The deaths are too numerous to count right now. Fellow church members, family members are being taken home to glory and we rejoice for them, but their loss is still great here. We pray for our nation and the turmoil that is represented in, in the division that exists. Never before have I seen such hatred, animosity toward those that have different political beliefs and opinions. We pray for the transition of power that will occur this week, that it will be smooth and that capitals in our nation and across states will be safe. We're commanded in Romans 13 to pray for our elected officials and so we pray that President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris will be your agents in the White House and will serve according to your purpose and your will. And we'll pray for them. We pray also, Lord, that you will continue to be behind this, this vaccine that's being disseminated that that it will go far and wide and, and enough um, vaccine will be produced that everybody can soon have it and, and this dreaded pandemic be behind us and the lessons that we've learned during this time will never be forgotten. We're not as smart or wise or strong as we once thought. And we see how quickly and easily our pride can be taken down. And so we depend on you. You alone are our strength. You alone are our shield. There's no one like you. And we need to be here today to worship you. And, and these who can't be here because of their vulnerabilities, because of their uh, concerns for, for illness, are worshiping with us. And we pray that you 
make us one in the body of Christ and that we would look to you to be our source, our hope, our purpose, our life. Speak to us, Lord, through words that I may say, through thoughts that, that people may have apart from my words that just come directly from your Holy Spirit within them. That it would remind us that you're with us through this. That nothing can separate us from your love which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. And so make your strength great within our weakness because we're acknowledging our need for you this day and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible is, is full of passages that, that tell us to rest. Ecclesiastes has a, a couple in there that are pretty significant. Being a musician, I know, I know what it is to rest because a rest is a part of music, right? And, and just because when it's a rest, you're not playing or singing, doesn't mean that it's not still a vital part of the music. Because if everybody was singing and playing all the time, there would be no variety to it. So resting is an important thing to do in music. I remember when I was in high school, I, I got invited to play in the drum section because there weren't enough drummers to play in the drum section and the band director said, I need you to play in the drum section, so do it. So that was my invitation to go play in the drum section. During the concert season, you played, you were liable to play the triangle or the cymbals or the timpani or the snare drum or the bass drummer, just a bunch of different things in there. And, and in concert season, it's just not totally full of, every song's not full of percussion parts. So you find yourself resting a lot in the per percussion section in concert season. If you don't watch out, you'll forget to count your rests or you'll, you'll miscount rests and you, you'll forget to come back in on time. So even when you're resting, it's an active thing because if you don't pay attention during the rest, you won't know when to come back in again, right? It's the same thing with, with us as believers. We've been forced really the past 10 months to do quite a bit of resting, but we don't want to get to the point where we're resting so much that we forget to count about knowing when to come back in. There's so many uh, people that, that are just in a state of uh, depression or despair or confusion that, that really don't know what to do. But let me encourage you to look to the scriptures, look to the God that you know, look to the God that you love so much, that loves you so much, that's never going to leave you without a comforter, that's never going to leave you without a promise, is never going to leave you without a purpose. God is here for us today. God is challenging his people during this time to step up, not necessarily just assume that you're resting. You know, it might be your time to come back in. So as we sing this song, we're going to sing the phrase, I am not alone. And we're going to sing it quite a few times. So I want you to claim that as we stand together. Let's sing this song. And let's really sing it as a testimony to each other and sing it as a song of promise because we know that God told us the truth when he said that, right? Okay, let's sing it together. When I walk through deep waters, I know that you will be with me. When I'm standing in the fire I will not be overcome through the valley of the shadow I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone you will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go 
back in the book of Acts, aren't we? Just make sure everybody's awake as we begin um, this study. I was looking at your worship bulletin. You already have the underlines filled in, so it's like we've given you the key to the test before you've had the test. So don't look at that until we get, until we get to it. 
This is basically an account of Paul's defense before the Sanhedrin. So what good does it do for us? Well, what it just reminds me is that there'll be days when you have to give an account of your faith. And it's not just knowing what to say or how to say it. It's whether or not you and I will have the courage and the boldness to actually speak it. The wherewithal to, to stand up in front of our peers, in front of non-believers, in front of those who cast doubt or aspersions on the name of Christ, would we be willing to stand for him? Speaking of standing, let's stand to read God's word, Acts 23, verses 1 through 11. This is the key of this passage. Um, at the end of chapter 22, which we covered back in November, because remember in November, then it was Christmas, and then the 1st of January was the Lord's Supper. So now we're picking back up in Acts 23. At the end of, of Acts 22, Paul is speaking to a group of Jews, basically giving his testimony, and it's, it's a lengthy testimony that he gives. We're going to look at some of that in the message this morning. Um, and then... He says something that stirs the Jews up and they fall on him to attack him and the Romans have to come in and rescue him. Um, and so Paul is with a Roman commander and the Roman commander wants to really get to the bottom of it. So he decides to take Paul to the Sanhedrin and kind of let, the, let them hash it out. And that's what's happening here in, in chapter 23. Paul, looking intently at the council, the council is the Sanhedrin, we'll talk about that in a minute, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God shall strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? Paul said, oh, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it's written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Verse 6, when Paul perceived that one part of the Sadducees and the other, that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out on the council, brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. With respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. When he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended, We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or angel spoke to him? When the dissension became violent, the tribune afraid that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. This is about the third time that the Romans had to go in and rescue Paul from the midst of the Jews. The final verse, verse 11, Paul hears a word from the Lord. Kind of makes you wonder, how do we have this account? How do we know what, what Jesus said to Paul? He must have, have shared it. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage. For as you have testified about me at Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also at Rome. In other words, Paul, I'm not finished with you, so don't worry what's happening right now around you. My work for you to do is not yet done on earth until you get to Rome. And, and we know that Paul wanted to get to Rome, and so that must have encouraged him, knowing that, that Jesus told him, it's not over yet. You've been faithful. I'm going to send you to Rome now. Let's pray. Father, as we look at how Paul responded with his testimony in the midst of, of dissension and persecution, not only did he stand up and, and know what to say, but he boldly said it, regardless of, of the consequences. And yet you were with him. He was not alone. Never are we alone. You'll never leave us, nor forsake us, will you? So be with us today in worship. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you. So Acts 22 
several weeks ago we looked at is concluding. And Paul, as I said, to a, a group of Jews is giving his testimony. He's talking about how the Lord led him and what he had done. And, and Paul gets in verse 18, uh, and Jesus once again said to him, Make haste and get quickly out of Jerusalem because they will not accept your testimony about me. Verse 21 Depart, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Well, as soon as Paul mentions the word Gentiles, that's like a buzzword for the Jewish people. And they get up in arms because rumor has been circulating that Paul has been taking Gentiles into the temple, which is forbidden. It is anathema. You do not, that defiles the temple to take non Jews into the temple. And so that gets them riled up. And uh, once again, there's, there's a, a melee that occurs. The Roman soldiers have to come in and rescue Paul. Basically, though, the real issue, the bottom line, is not whether or not Paul took Gentiles into the temple, whether or not he defiled the temple. That's not the issue. The issue is whether Judaism would be willing to accept and tolerate Christianity. Up until this time, Christianity has been under the, the umbrella of Judaism and has enjoyed the protection that Judaism had from the Romans. Judaism is getting ready to push Christianity out and away from them to stand on its own. And whether or not the Romans will tolerate Christianity apart from Judaism will become an issue. So the Jews are falling upon Paul, the Romans intervened, and the Romans are getting ready to scourge Paul. That's Apparently, that is their lie detector. <laughs> That's their lie detector test. Verse 25, Paul, um, the tribune, as they cried out, waved their garments, threw dust in the air. Verse 24 of chapter 22, the tribune, who is Lysias, the commander of the Romans, commanded him to be brought into the barracks, ordered them to, ex to be examined by scourging. Now, you know what scourging is. It's the flogging. It is the flagellation that Jesus underwent with, uh, with they call it the cat of nine tails. It was a wooden handle that had nine leather thongs, and it wasn't just leather thongs. It was leather thongs that had be bits of metal and glass and rock embedded in the thong, the throng. And, and they took that and threw it across a man's back and didn't just hit it, but they let those bits of metal and glass dig into the flesh and then rip it across the back of the flesh. It was so excruciating that a lot of men died just from scourging, just from flogging. Thankfully, Paul at that moment said, is it legal to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen? Paul tells them, I'm a Roman citizen, and basically you cannot scourge, you cannot flog a Roman citizen apart from a legal trial. That was one of the rights of being a Roman citizen. And Lysias, the Roman commander, said, you're a, you're a Roman citizen? I'm a Roman citizen because I paid a large amount of money, but you're a Roman citizen from birth, being from Tarsus, being somehow Paul's family had become Roman citizens, and it would be an easy thing to check in the records at Tarsus. And so being a Roman citizen from birth is much more significant than just being a Roman citizen by buying it. And so they stopped immediately what they were doing. You cannot scourge a Roman citizen without a trial. And so Acts 23 comes up. Lysias says, well, I can't scourge him. I want to get to the truth. What can I do? I know I'll put him in the midst of the Sanhedrin and let them hash it out. And that's what Acts 23 is all about. Why is this relevant for us? Why, why do we even, well, first of all, we know all scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, right? So there's something that God has to teach us here in Acts 23. What is it? I think God's trying to show us that once again, it's not just knowing what to say, it's having the courage to say it. And, and, and to see how Jesus is with Paul in the midst of him giving his testimony. How did Jesus come alongside? He's, we're, he's always with us. He's, we're never alone. He's with us. He will be with us. And I think we see how Paul's weakness makes Christ's strength even more manifest. You know, I love that passage in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 
25, my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you are weak, when you realize that you can't do it alone, when you can't do it by yourself, then you will look to me and let me flow in and through you and give you the strength you need. But because until you get to that point, what? You're going to continue thinking, I am smart enough. I am strong enough. I can do this by myself. And you realize how, how foolhardy that really is. So Paul is at the, at the end of his rope. You know, he was human. Let's just be honest. Paul had his ups and downs just like any of us. We think that, you know, that Paul is up here and that he never had challenges. He never had difficulties. You know, he's singing in prison in, in Philippi and, and it's all a bed of roses. No, Paul is human. Paul is has his struggles, he has his difficulties, he has his challenges. And here, let me read this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He's just admitting, I mean, this is what he's going through. We have this treasure, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are weak, we have clay feet to show that the transcendent power belongs to God. And not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. I mean, Paul is just saying... I am flesh, I am human, I am an earthen vessel, I am a clay jar. And all that is possible so that Jesus can, can flow through me. And he's going to be faithful to me. And that's what's happening right here. As I mentioned, this passage is not easy to preach because it, it's just recording Paul's actions. But we can see how Paul responded in the midst of the Sanhedrin, how the Lord was with him in that course of events that transpired in those heated moments. Paul basically has three responses in this, in this trial. And uh, full disclosure, let me just, there's a guy named Tony Merida who has a, a, a commentary uh, on the book of Acts. It's an exposition on Acts. And this outline basically comes from him. And, and he mentioned that there are three responses. You remember how when you're young and you're trying to decide something, you have rock, paper, scissors. Kind of think of that, only the order here is paper, rock, scissors. What's the paper? Well, the paper is in chap chapter 22, verse 25. Is it lawful to scourge a man who's a Roman citizen? Paul is throwing the paper of his Roman citizenship down in front of the Roman tribune, Lysias. You can't do this to a Roman citizen. Lysias decides that he can get to the truth by a flogging and once again scourging the leather thongs, the glass, the metal, the rock embedded in that leather ripped across your back. It is a devastating means of punishment and I don't know how, I mean if somebody did that to me I'd pretty well tell them anything they wanted to hear. But Lysias says I'm going to get to the truth through a scourging. Lysias had bought his citizenship. Paul had his from birth. That's the paper. That's his first defense. Now, should Paul have, have thrown that out there? Yes, I think so. If, if Paul had not used his citizenship as a means of stopping the scourging, he, he, he was going to be scourged. And, and as I said, it took the life of many men. You remember Jesus, when he was scourged, he wasn't even strong enough to carry the cross to Calvary after that. It, it was a devastating, life-threatening means of punishment. And so Paul says, you can't scourge a Roman citizen apart from a legal and fair trial. And so they stop. And Lysias says, well, now how am I going to get to the truth? Let's take him to the Sanhedrin and let them decide. And that's the, the rock part. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, verse 
uh, 1 of chapter 23, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. The high priest Ananias, who incidentally was an evil, selfish high priest, uh, later on he is assassinated by his own people for being so wicked. Uh, he commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Paul said, are you, you whitewashed wall, are you striking me? Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, contrary to the Lord law, you order me to be struck? And those who stood by, are you reviling God's high priest? Oh, Paul said, I didn't know that he was a high priest. I'm sorry. It's written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So Lysias takes Paul to the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin composed of Sadducees and Pharisees. The Sadducees incidentally, are the aristocracy. They were the landed gentry. They were the ones who wanted to protect the status quo because they had it, I mean, they had it, they had a pretty sweet life and they were going to protect that. The Pharisees were more representative of the common people. They were the protectors of the law. They were the scribes. They were the lawyers. They were the ones who studied God's word and tried to live it out and encourage the, the people of Israel to do the same. So there were two distinct parties among the Sanhedrin. Um, Ananias, when Paul says, I have lived before God in good conscience this day, Ananias, the high priest, tells those by him to strike him in the mouth, meaning that he had uttered blasphemy. And I'm sure it wasn't just a little tap. I'm sure it was a slap that drew blood from Paul's mouth because of the blasphemy that Ananias judged Paul had uttered. Paul said, you are like a whitewashed wall. Do you remember when Jesus called the, the scribes and Pharisees in chapter uh, Matthew 23? Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, because you are whitewashed tombs. Do you remember that? Basically what he's saying, you are, you look good on the outside, you're all nice and clean and white, but a whitewashed tomb on the inside just houses dead bones and rotting flesh. That's what Jesus said of the scribes and Pharisees. And Paul, kind of along those same lines, says, you're like a whitewashed wall. Yeah, I, I, think, I was thinking about this. In southern terms, we would say that's like putting lipstick on a pig. You know, you might try to dress him up on the outside, but he's still a pig. And here's whitewashed wall. You know, it might look good on the outside, but on the inside, it's just rotting dead man's bones. And so the people say, are you reviling God's high priest? And Paul said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was the high priest. Oh, yes, he did. Paul knew who the high priest was. But I think what Paul is saying is, how was I supposed to know he's the high priest by the way he's acting? He's not acting like the high priest. He doesn't look like the high priest. He, you know, the way he's living his life is not like a high priest should be living. So what clues should I have that he's the high priest besides his garments, perhaps? He doesn't look like any high priest I've ever known. And so the rock is hurled at the high priest. Paper, rock. Scissors. The scissors is the division that Paul creates between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You know, they, they came together and worked together as a Sanhedrin, you know, because sometimes having a common enemy makes strange bedfellows. Have you heard that before? And they had the common enemy of Paul. And so the Sanhedrin, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees worked together because they had a common enemy of Paul, but Paul is smart enough as a Pharisee to know that there were bones of contention between the Sadducees and Pharisees, and Paul decides to, to hurl a grenade in the middle of the Sanhedrin and bring up some of the things that they argue over. He divides them, verses 6 through 10. When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, Paul knew that one part was Sadducees, the other Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, he cried out, I'm a Pharisee. With respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I'm on trial. Well, when Paul said the word resurrection, that was one of the bones of contention between the Sadducees and Pharisees. 
The assembly was divided. Verse 8, the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no angel, no spirit. The Pharisees acknowledged them all. The Sadducees only believed in the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, the Torah. Genesis, what are they? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The law, the Torah, the first five books. That was the Sadducees' scriptures. Well, the Pharisees accepted the remaining books of Scripture. In those first five books, there is no account of a resurrection of angels or spirits, but there is in the remaining parts of Scripture. So the Sadducees there, say there is no resurrection. There, is no, there are no angels. There are no spirits. The Pharisee says there is a resurrection. There are angels. There are spirits. And they argued over that constantly. And anytime anybody wanted to bring up a division between them, they would throw that in. So things really get exciting now as Paul lobs this grenade into the midst of the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees actually believed the resurrection was the ultimate hope of Israel. That was the only way Israel was going to be saved was by a resurrection because things had gotten so desperate, so behind. And Paul who believed in the resurrection, believed that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Pharisaic hope of the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. That would be their hope one day. And Paul says, you want to believe in the resurrection? Well, brothers, Jesus brought it. Jesus is our source. He is our hope. He's here. This resurrection that you have been awaiting, that you've been hoping for has come. And it's in the form of a man who is the way, the truth, and the life. It is in Jesus. Well, when the scribes, the Pharisees, and the, and the Sadducees, when they fall on each other again, Paul is in the middle of it, and he has to be rescued a third time. <laughs> Seems like the Romans are always rescuing Paul. And, and let me just tell you, the Romans could really care less if the Jews beat each other up. But what the Romans were responsible for was maintaining peace. And, it, and when it looked like a riot was getting ready to break out, that's why they had to step in and restore order. Because Rome said, if you can't keep order in that little town, that little city of Jerusalem, if you can't keep, we'll send somebody who can. And eventually that's what happens about 30, 40 years later. They send the Roman army in and, and the Jews are carried off, the temple is destroyed, and um, it's just a terrible time. But at this time, the Roman garrison, incidentally, because things happened so often in the temple, the Romans actually garrisoned soldiers right adjacent to the temple. And if you go to the archaeology of the temple today, there is called the Fortress of Antonia, right beside the temple. Why did the Romans build a, a garrison, a fortress right beside the temple? Because they had to go in all the time and, and stop riots, stop uprisings, stop rebellions that seemed to be occurring rather frequently among the Jewish people. And so they said, I mean, it's, it's like putting a police substation right there in the middle of the temple just to keep order because they knew if they didn't do it, that Rome would send somebody who could, and it'd be even worse. So Paul has to be rescued a third time, but he's encouraged. In verse 11, this is a word from the Lord. The following night, Paul's in the, in the barracks, being guarded by Roman soldiers. And the Lord stood by him. He stood by him. He said, I'm here. Take courage, for since you've testified before me in Jerusalem, you've been faithful in Jerusalem, I'm going to use you to bear witness also in Rome. It's like, you've been faithful to me in Tifton, in Atlanta, I'm going to send you to, to Washington, D.C. The, the first thing that just comes to mind is that, is that the Lord knew, he knew him. He knew his name. He knew his situation. He knew his condition. The things that Paul was going through was, did not come as a surprise to, to the Lord. It, it did not come unexpected. And, and the Lord was with him. 
And as I said, this had to be a low point in Paul's life. Jesus, I've been so faithful. I've, I've done nothing but testify to you, to, to my experiences, to, to give a witness, to do it boldly. And yet, here I am on the verge of being uh, beaten three times. I'm in prison again. It had to be a difficult time. Paul was, Paul was human. Sometimes we make him larger than life, but, but he was a man. And this was the third time he had to be rescued from being, it says really, they were going to tear him to pieces. Third time he had to keep from being torn to pieces. So he knows our name, he knows our condition, he knows our situation, and he is with us. It says literally, the Lord stood by him. Paul must have felt alone, but the Lord was always with us. He is standing by us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord will never abandon you. You might feel like you're alone. You might feel like you're abandoned, but don't base your relationship with the Lord on feelings. Feelings are emotions. Emotions are fickle. Base your relationship with Christ on the truth of God's word, which is eternal and unchangeable. I am with you. I will never leave you nor abandon you nor forsake you. He is with him. He stood by him and said, take courage. The Lord is for us. Three attempts on Paul's life in the space of two days. Three times the Jewish people tried to tear Paul to pieces in 48 hours time frame. The Lord tells him to take courage. I looked up this word, take courage, it's the same word that's used in Mark chapter 6, verse 50. Uh, the disciples are in the boat. A storm is raging. Jesus is walking toward them on the water. They think it is a spirit coming to them. And the first word Jesus says, take courage, take heart. It is I. Have no fear. Take courage. It is I. Have no fear. I am with you. You can take courage. You can take heart because I will never leave you. I am with you despite what you might feel. He tells him to, to keep up the good work. You've been faithful in Jerusalem. I'm going to send you to Rome now. You know, it just, it just reminds me that God doesn't assign us huge tasks until we've been faithful in little tasks. Do you remember the, I just remember the parable of the talents in, where is that, Matthew 20, 25. You know the parable of the talents, here's five talents, here's five talents more, here's two talents, here's two talents. You've been faithful in the least, in the least, I'm going to put you over much, enter into the joy of your master. Be faithful in the little responsibilities and the little duties that God has given you. And then he'll be preparing you for the greater ones down the road. Because if you try to launch into the greater ones without having climbed the steps to get there, you could fail. I had friends at seminary, I was just thinking about this this morning, and they said, I want to pastor a mega church one day. I said, okay. Good for you. Will you be faithful in the small church along the way? You be faithful in where God has placed you right now, and he'll prepare you for that, that greater responsibility down the road. Because if he, if he threw, he's not going to throw you into the deep end until you've learned to swim in the shallow end, right? And so he tells Paul, you've been faithful in Jerusalem. I'm going to send you to Rome, and you can bear witness to me there. Faithful in little is necessary preparation to be faithful in much. So he knows our name. He's with us. He's for us. And finally, he's not finished with us. He's not going to let anything happen to us until he's completed his work in us, until we've completed the work that he has assigned us to do, And Paul learns that, that Jesus intends for him to go to Rome, and Paul had always wanted to go to Rome. And so he can rest assured that, that 
nothing's going to happen until he gets to Rome where he's able to bear witness to Christ. So what does this tell us? Well, what, what does this mean for me? I mean, I'm not Paul. I don't have visions and hear voices like Paul did. But look what we have that Paul didn't have. We have the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't. We have the New Testament. We have the, the Old and New Testament scriptures. Paul didn't have that. He wrote some of them, but he didn't have all the gospels. He didn't have it all. We have the power of prayer. All these things Jesus has given us. So we have everything we need to bear witness and to do it boldly, to have courage for Christ. No, we don't have what Paul had, but we have what we need because Jesus has given it to us. Pray with me. God, we see how Paul stood up in front of the Sanhedrin, how he held his own, how you had prepared him for that eventuality, knowing that it was going to happen, knowing that it was going to come, and that he had the words to say, he had the experience to back it up, he had uh, the resources of spirit and, and intellect, and yet you also emboldened him to say it. There'll be times, Lord, when we are called upon to give a witness for you. And honestly, we know what to say. The question is, do we have the conviction and courage to actually say it? And so give us the Holy Spirit. Give us the wisdom of scriptures. Give us the power of prayer to be able to stand boldly and testify to our faith in you because that time is coming. Help us be faithful in the little steps along the way that will prepare us for greater responsibilities down the road. And may your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing an invitational hymn, Who Can Satisfy? If you tried other things, I, I've read testimonies. <laughs> I can think of some right now. Folks who've tried everything and found it ultimately unsatisfying until they found Jesus and found what their soul was looking for their entire lives. And they found their rest in him. Stand with me if you're looking for something. Jesus is the source. He is the hope. He is your purpose. I'm at the front to receive you. Barry's going to lead us as we sing. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful, true? I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. There is a fountain. Who is the king? Victorious warrior and lord of everything. My rock, my shelter. Life abundantly. 
Thank you. Have a seat. As John comes to give us some announcements, we have some deaths that I want to uh, just just for a lay so you can be praying for the family. First of all, we had the funeral for Robert Pilkington, who served as an usher here for so many years. A graveside service yesterday morning at Tiff Memorial Gardens. I have a family service uh, for the family of uh, Estelle Hilliard this afternoon in our chapel. So be praying for the Hilliard family, the Pilkington family, the Hilliard family. And then yesterday... Uh, we learned the sad news of the passing of the father of Jason Womack. Uh, Roger Womack passed away unexpectedly yesterday of a heart attack. And uh, that family is making arrangements at All Britain Funeral Homes. So that's pending. So be praying for Jason and his family, the Womack family, in the days ahead. John's going to come now and share some announcements with us. just want to remind you uh, what a wonderful opportunity we're having to serve the Lord in these challenging times as Barry and Brother Wayne have challenged us. Uh, there are opportunities for volunteering to serve at our church in a lot of different ways. Just go to fbctifton.org slash serve and uh, avail yourself of those opportunities. And the last um, just announcement I'd like to share with you is about the Tift Area Celebration with Will Graham. Uh, originally a three-day event it's now a one-day event that'll be on February the 6th. It'll have a, a children's component that'll begin at 10 a.m. that morning, and everybody's invited to the 7 p.m. Uh, worship. There's only 500 seats available. It'll be in our ministry center for social distancing purposes. So what we're encouraging, yes, please uh, call, I mean, uh, email and make your reservation, or we're gonna have watch parties at our homes. You can watch it online. So we're wanting everyone to have the opportunity to hear the gospel. And finally, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We're uh, closing in on our goal. We, uh, we're, our goal is 90000 and we've given approximately 62000 So we want to continue just to press on forward so that the cause of international missions can go forward. Thank you. Would you stand with us as we uh, prepare to leave? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the, the presence of the Holy Spirit among us today. And Lord, we know that you didn't just call us to salvation. You called us to service. You've allowed us, um, most of us here this morning, some watching uh, by live stream or TV, you've allowed us uh, to be healthy enough to be mobile and help us to be able to recognize opportunities of service when we see those and to act on them. Lord, we pray for your protection for us. We pray, God, that you would motivate us, made us to serve you in a way that, that maybe we haven't uh, been motivated in a while and may you get the glory God for the victories that are won for your kingdom this week through these people through your people in Jesus name amen